this evening, I'm going to be talking a little bit about courage. And the courage that a lot of times when it comes to mind that we think about it is the physical courage. The courage that most of our battle, our men, the military goes into, and they get into that kind of courage, that mindset that puts them straight forward to do what they have to do. That's kind of not what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about the same boldness and the same courage of what we have as Christians, as believers. And what is the true meaning of courage? Courage is bravery, valor, it refers to the qualities of the spirit and the conduct. Courage permits one to face extreme dangers and difficulties without fear to take or to lose. Courage, bravery implies true courage with daring and, and interpret boldness, bravery in battle. That's what courage means. And as I, I start to talk about courage, I'm, I'm going to refer to a lot of scripture today. We're going to be doing a lot of different reading. But I'm going to be talking about courage as we come into courage, courage as we're in the middle of our war, and courage when we come out of it. So there's actually three different steps that I'm going to be referring to. And there's going to be a couple of things that I ask you to note down and, and take reference to because I'm going to refer back to it. And one of the two things that I want to develop first is how, do you, how, how is courage developed? Because most of us don't have that courage to go out to battle. We don't. It has to be learned. There's a process to learning that courage to develop, to gain the strength. It's like us in the Word. When we first come to our Word, we don't know a lot of the Word. We're, we're just babies in Christ, and we got to be fed little by little by little. But as we get fed, our courage to, to have faith, our courage to believe, our courage to have hope starts to develop and get strength, and it gets stronger, and it becomes boldness in it. So here again, I'm going to say, how is courage developed? In order to begin building courage, you need to determine your specific fear. What is that fear that keeps you from having courage? For totally selling off for Christ. It could, it could be your finances. It could be your home. It could be your marriage. It could be your children. It could be something that's holding you back from letting go 100% because you fear of losing that one thing. And that fear is what's keeping you back from a full development of courage. You may not even be aware of the specific fears until you begin to think about what causes you to have the lack of courage. I ask you this at home today. Write a list of your fears as you figure them out. They may help you develop a plan to overcome them to build your courage. And I've written down two scriptures that I'm going to start off with. And uh, actually, these two scriptures sum up my whole my whole message. But these two, I, I should be done. Cancel, turn it off. But uh, I can't. So I'm going to read them to you. The first one is Joshua 1 9. It says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. I'm going to repeat that again. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. The opposite of fear is cur courageous, being courteous. Uh, uh, cur uh, courageous is the opposite of fear. It says, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God is going to walk with you and prepare you in every step that you take. Now, these two verses that I'm giving you, they're just laying the foundation as I get into my message. Now, the second uh, scripture, it's a very hard word for me, but I'm going to do my best. De Deuteronomy 31.6. It says, again, be strong and courageous. Again, do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you, and he will never leave you or forsake you. If you stand just on those two scriptures today, it will tell you how he prepares you for the battles. Courage is also called good cheer, which means boldness and confidence. Courage is the boldness Good cheer is the confidence in Christ that we have. It's always referred to as fear not, be of good cheer. It means to be confident, to be courageous, and to be of good cheer. The word has been translated, be of good cheer, or be of good comfort. As we generally find it in the authorized versions of our Bibles, but in others prefer, be of good courage. Be confident. Take heart. And a loosely version says, cheer up. But it all means the same. 
So what does the Bible say about courage? As I mentioned earlier, the, the Bible talked about uh, courage is also called good cheer. The Greek word translated Greek, I mean, ch- ch- oh, I apologize. The Greek word translated courage and good cheer means literally boldness and confidence. And that's the boldness and confidence that we got to have in our walk with Christ and what we believe who Christ is to us and how he is in our lives. The scriptures that I'm going to start off with today is going to be Mark 6, 34 through 52. And I kind of went a little bit behind because I do want to show you where the disciples were at and where their faith was at, where their courage was at in Christ at that given moment. So I got to take it back just a little bit to take it forward. It says, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them. Many things. So off the bat, we see Jesus. What does he do? He sees a situation, he addresses it, and he handles it instantly. Verse 35 says, by this time it was late in the day. So that's the first part I want you to remember. It's late in the day. So his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's very, already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countrysides and villages and buy themselves something to eat. So you got to remember the disciples already had been with Jesus for a little bit. And they were still doubting. They still didn't have that courage to believe who he was. Because in this scripture right there and there, he's, the disciples are saying, get rid of them. We don't want to feed them. We don't waste our time with them. They still didn't develop that courage. What God, that what God was trying to teach them, they could not comprehend it yet. In verse 37 it says, but he answered, you give them something to eat. Then, then said to him, they said to him, that would take more than a half of year's wages. Again, just that courage not to believe, not to have that faith. They were constantly looking at things with their eyes and not with God's eyes. Are, are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it them to eat? Verse 38 says, how many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five loaves and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the grass. So they sat down in the groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute them to the people. He also divided the fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And his disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who who had eaten was 5,000. Now I'm thinking of that number and I'm thinking everything they went through at that given moment right then and there. And this is what, 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 what came to my mind. It says, when Jesus asked the disciples to provide food for over 5,000 people, they asked in astonishment if they should go and spend that month's wages. They couldn't understand that God was going to create a miracle yet because they haven't fully developed the courage to believe, the courage to, to develop faith yet. I ask you this. How do you react when you are given an imp- impossible task? Do you try to d- deal with it on your own or do you run to the Lord? Do you fall to your knees and ask for prayer or do you try to uh, do it on your own? A situation like that seems impossible for the human resources. It's simply an opportunity for God to show who he is. The disciples did everything they could to gather the available food and organize the people into groups. Then, in answer to prayer, God did the impossible. When facing an impossible task, do what you can and ask God to do the rest. He may see it fit to do the, make the impossible happen for you. And when I was thinking about that, I was thinking that our responsibility in it is to go to the Father and ask for the help that we need. Ask for strength, ask for boldness, ask for courage so that we can understand where we need to be, where he wants us to be in our lives. But the disciples at that moment, they were doing things for themselves, seeing things out of their own eyes. As we continue on, it says, why did Jesus bother to feed the people? He could have easily 
have sent them on their way. Jesus did not ignore needs. However, he is concerned with every aspect of our lives, the physical as well as the spiritual, that he, that he meets it. Jesus has compassion for the, hung, the hungry people, and it's recorded in all four Gospels. For people who are desperately hungry, there is no better way for us to show God's love to them than to help to provide for their physical need. As we are being whole, wholeness to people's lives, we must never ignore the fact that all of us have both a physical and spiritual needs. It is impossible to minister effectively to the spiritual without considering the physical need. You know, I remember when we used to do a lot of, we used to walk the city here in Almani a lot. And uh, Pastor Daisy, the first thing that she would do is she would set up the, the eagles and they would prepare a breakfast for us. So that our physical body would be nourished to go out to the streets to minister. They'd give us little waters to put in our backpacks so that if we got thirsty, we would able, be able to drink. But the whole thing is that God was preparing us physically to go out to do the spiritual work that he wants us to do. And we did that. We would walk the city from the four corners and meet back in the center. And that's how God is preparing us all the time. He's preparing you all the time the same way. So I'm going to go back to uh, Mark. And pick it up at Mark 45, uh, 47. I'm sorry, 45. It says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bathsheba, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on the hillside to pray. Later that night, now remember it was earlier that evening, later the night, it says, He saw the, the, he saw the disciples straining at the oars. Because of the wind that was against them. Shortly before dawn, so now we're talking afternoon, say 3 o'clock. Now we're talking nighttime. Now we're talking morning before Jesus went out there. That was a long time. Now my thought, and I'm thinking, he must have been mad at them because they still couldn't receive. They couldn't understand or comprehend what he was trying to teach them. They couldn't muster up enough courage to believe yet. Just like some of us, we struggle to believe. We struggle to have that courage to sell out 100% in Christ. We struggle, just as the disciples did here. It says, um, Surely before dawn he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. And I asked my wife that. I said, that's kind of messed up. Was he going to literally just walk by them and go to the other side? You know, I just, you know, food for thought in my mind. It says, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and he said, what did he say? He said, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. And that's what we need. We need courage, not fear. The disciples were still fearing all this. They were fearing the waves. They were out there physically fighting the wind instead of being on their knees and praying and asking for God to be there for them. We keep running to the wrong places. Instead of running to God, we run to ourselves. And that's what the disciples were doing here. It says, then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. Right then and there, I would have just flipped out. I would have said, oh, my God. They were completely amazed. For they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. The disciples didn't want to believe, perhaps. There's various reasons. Uh, one, they couldn't accept the fact that this human named Jesus was really the Son of God. Two, they dared not to believe that the Messiah would choose them as his followers. Just as some of us, we struggle with that. How can God choose me, the wretched man that I am, the ugly person that I am from my past? How can he choose me to be one of his servants, one of his followers? This is something they struggled with just like many of us struggle with today. Three. They still did not understand the real purpose of Jesus coming to the earth. Their disbelief took the form of misunderstanding. 
Even after watching Jesus miraculously feed 5,000 people, they still could not take the final step of faith and believe. They didn't have the courage that he was the son of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. They, if they had, they would not have been amazed that Jesus could walk on water. Their faith was still not there. They didn't have enough courage to understand who they were walking with. Who had they been walking with? They had five loaves and two fish and fed the numbering 5,000 plus and still had a surplus left over. And even at that point, they still could not comprehend it. They didn't have enough courage to believe at that moment of the God that, that they served, the God that we serve today. And as we go through our trials and tribulations and the things that we go through, how are we going through it? Where's our courage? Where's our faith? Do we have that boldness and that courage that we need? Or do we walk kind of, you know, we're, I was trying to get this together with my wife earlier, and I didn't know how to put it together too good. But how many remember the Wizard of Oz? Huh? The Wizard of Oz? Who was the lion? What was he? The Carly Lion. He was a Carly Lion through the whole movie. That's who he was. And then towards the end, when they found out the wizard, the wizard, what did the wizard tell him? He just told him that he had the courage in him. It's not something that he was going to give a spell on. The courage was in him, just like the courage is in us. But for us, we go to our word to get that strength and that boldness and that confidence that we need in Christ. Because we need his strength. You know, the word says that we can do all things through Christ. And that's where we need to be in our spirit. We need to... Be there through Christ. It says, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, when God commands us to fear not and to be a good cheer and to have courage, he is always commanding against fear, which is the opposite of courage. Courage is the opposite of fear. So if you have fear right now in your life, in your walk, you don't have courage. You don't have that boldness. You don't have that confidence in Christ that you need. You have to figure out what is your fear. What's keeping you from having that fullness of Christ in your life? There's going to be a couple of stories that I read. And one of them it really just mm, jerks my you know, chain, like they say. And it's, but it, it's the way she responds to the answer, to the question. But God doesn't simply command courage for no reason behind it. In nearly every incident where God says, fear not, there follows a reason to have courage. And that reason is God himself, his nature, and his perfect plans. God's going to always prepare us through his word. He's going to tell you where to have courage. He's going to tell you what to stay away from, what not to do, even though you don't listen, then you fall into it, and then, you know, things happen. God will always prepare you for the battle. And as we read in the scriptures of Joshua and Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, he goes before us, and he walks with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. His plans are perfect according to his will. Just like in Genesis 15, 1, when God calms Abraham's fears about the battle with the kings of Solomon, the captivity of Lot, and his rescue, God tells Abraham, fear not, for I am your shield. Again, he's telling them to have courage. Because he was his shield. He gave him the victory. He gave him the victory that he needed. So as I get prepared into my, one of my first stories, it, it, it's, it's about Hagar. And most of us know who that is. But again, I'm going to go a little bit in the beginning, a little bit in the middle, and a little bit at the end. So let me start off with Genesis 21, 11 through 19. It says, the matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. So Abraham was struggling right, struggling right in the beginning of this situation to, to be a part of this situation that was presented to him. But instantly, but God said to him, do not be distressed about the boy and the slave woman. God responded quickly to Abraham because he knew Abraham was a servant. He knew he was faithful. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be numbered. I will make the son of the slave woman into a nation also because he is your offspring. 
So this is that early the next morning, Abraham took some food and some in the skin of water and gave it to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her and the boy off. Now, as I read that, I thought, how what, what kind of courage would I have to pack my wife and my son in time to get out of here town? I, I don't know how I would have that kind of courage. But Abraham had courage. And he did. He was obedient. He had that boldness and the confidence in the God that he served. And that's how we got to be. When God speaks, we got to listen. We got to make that move without doubt, with full courage and power and boldness behind it. And it says, and then she, what did she do? She went on her way and wandered in the desert, in Beersheba. So she went in and with her strength and her boldness in Christ, she took off. She knew what she had to do. But then again, like most of us, when we start running fast in Christ, there's a problem somewhere. The road gets a little shaky on ours. And this is what happens here. When the water in the wineskin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. When she, <clears throat> excuse me, when she went off and sat down about a buck shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat here, she began to sob. So when we start off with the boldness and courage in Christ, you know, we have that victory. We have that power. But as we start going through the, 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 our life's turmoils, the giants, the, the things that are attacking us start to come away. And we start to lose that courage. We start to lose that boldness. We take our eyes off of Christ and we can't. We can't not take our eyes off of Christ because the minute we take our eyes off, we fall. We need to remain focused and courage on Christ all the time. Verse 17 says, God heard the boy crying and the angel called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what is, what is the matter, Hagar? It was like the angel that God sent was telling her, like, what's up? What are you doing? Because they knew her spirit, but yet she was, was battling. She was falling weak at that moment because she took her eyes off of Jesus. And the first thing the angel told her, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. The opposite of fear is what? Courage. Get your courage back, woman. Get, back, get it back together. Vamanos. That's what he was telling her right here. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take his hand, for I will make him a great nation. God has a plan. God has a plan. You need to remain faithful. You need to remain with boldness and courage in the God that we serve. You need to understand who, who he is. And you only know that by reading his word, by being in his word. He says, and then check this out. I was talking about how we get our eyes off of Christ. It says, then God opened her eyes, and he saw a well of water. So she went and filled the wineskin with water and gave the boy a drink. Sometimes when we get lost in, in, in the desert and what we're going through, we lose the sight of what God called us to do or to be. You know, this kind of reminds me, um, I do a lot of off-roading in, up in the sand deserts. And we've uh, been looking for this flagpole for the last five years and have been able to find it. It's a memorial they have for the fire department that uh, I believe was in Arizona that got burned in that big fire that they had. It's a memorial. It's out in the middle of the desert. And uh, so, you know, we drive to a certain point and we're like, we know what's around here, but we couldn't find it. But fear was setting in us because we would look at the big mountains and we were scared to go over the big mountains. You know, so we just like, we just stop right here. We'll just hang out here and then we'll go back home before it gets dark. So we kept going to that same spot over and over because fear kept keeping us. So this last trip, a friend of mine and his wife went and uh, he stood focused on the path. And guess what? That path led him to right to the pole. So we took our eyes off the path, which we should have kept our eyes on the path and we would have hit the light pole. But that's what happens in Christ. Sometimes we take our eyes off of Christ right before the victory, right before we have that victory that he's going to provide for us. In each incident, we see God commanding courage, 
not because it's unnatural for man to be brave or courageous, but because when God is protecting and guiding us, we can have courage because we are confident in him. Our courage comes from Christ. It doesn't come from us. Now, we're going to get into a new little story in the New Testament, and it's about Mary, Mary, Mary. We all know who Mary is, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about Mary and uh, what she went through. Uh, Luke 1, 26 through, I think, 38. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel, Gabriel, to Nazareth, a, <clears throat> a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. A virgin's name, and excuse me, the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, "Greetings, you are highly flavored, favored. The Lord is with. The Lord has. I'm sorry. Let me read that again. Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. You know, when was the last time we did anything to stop God in His presence to turn around and answer one of your prayers like that?" I can't remember. I can't remember, honestly. It says, Mary was greatly troubled at these words and wondering what kind of greeting this might be. So she started struggling a little bit because she was unsure. But the angel said to her again, do not be afraid. Have courage. Remember, opposite of fear is courage. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And then Mary responds, says, how will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the most high will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who has said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. Verse 37 says, For no word from God will ever fail. His word will not come back void ever. But I want to focus on this last, last verse, 38. And I love it. Because this is a boldness. This is confidence. This is what we need to be. It says, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Did you hear the boldness and confidence in who she was? And who the God that she served? Never mind poor Joseph. Because it was nowadays if Maria came and said, I'm pregnant, I'd be saying, what? You what? You know, I'd be going crazy. Pregnant by what? No, no, heck, no, no, not me. You know, how would he react to this day? But poor Joseph, it took him a while, too, to figure this out. He didn't just accept it. But think about what she didn't doubt. She didn't plan. She didn't think about Joseph. She didn't think about anybody else. The only thing she thought about was fulfilling what she was asked to do. That was it. That was her plan. Nothing else. And to me, I thought that was so awesome, that, 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 that boldness and confidence, because she understood the God that she served. And we need to understand the God that we serve and who he is in our lives with that type of boldness and courage and confidence. That's who we need to be in Christ. Luke 1, 1 through 20. This is another story. It says, then the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zacharias saw him, he was startled and was gripping with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid. Zacharias, your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you will call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other ferment drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. 
he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the land their God, the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to the, their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteousness to make ready the people and prepare for the Lord. Zacharias needed courage. He needed courage. He lacked courage. He prayed and prayed for something. But as it came to pass, he didn't have that courage. And I'll read to you on verse 18. It says, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this doubt? I am, in, I am an old man and my wife is well in, along in years. He didn't have the courage to believe what he was asking for. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you to tell you this good news. Because Zacharias didn't believe. And like most of us, when God tells us something, will give us a word. Do we listen? Do we ponder it? Or do we just throw it to a side? I know when I was battling a lot of things in my early walk with Christ, I had a, a brother here in the church, and he would say, bro, you know, don't do this, don't do that, you know. I know you're hurting, but, you know, it's just going to make things worse. So you think I would listen, right? Nah, I didn't. it went exactly what he told me not to do. It made things worse. And this is what happened to Zacharias here. He said, now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. And that's one of the biggest struggles that we have, that we're such a society that wants it now, 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 now. You know, and, and there was a cartoon, a cartoon movie, and I, I can't remember the name. And, and, and I kind of think about it to the times that we're going through now. But this uh, community, they lived on a little uh, uh, big old ship, and they didn't do nothing for themselves. They got dressed by machines. And every, the machines did everything for them. You know, they were like really obese and lazy and stuff. And that was kind of the part of the cartoon. The whole point was they were trying to get back to Earth, but the captain of the ship kept saying that Earth was still poisonous. So he didn't take him back because he loved the fact that the ship did everything for everybody. And that's kind of the society that we are now. We're such in a fast-paced society. We want everybody just to do things now. Boom, boom, boom. We don't want to wait on God's word. Because sometimes God's word might be today. It might be tomorrow. And it might be seven years from now. But it's at his appointed time, just like he told Zacharias here. In each incident, the courage commanded is a result of understanding the, the foreknowledge and the independence of God, whose plans and purposes cannot be dissatisfied, and whose authority makes every circumstance a life obedient to his will. And, and our, our responsibility in this is to understand God, understand God and who he is. And we do that, once again, by reading his word and studying his word and fellowshipping with one another so that we can understand that foreknowledge of Christ so that we'll have that knowledge and be prepared for those battles. So we will have the courage when we need the courage. We'll have the boldness when we need the boldness. We'll have the faith when we need the faith. And that's what it's about. Because he has plans and he has purposes for all of us. And if we are obedient to that, we will have an obedient life in Christ. God's promise to us is to have the same foundation as the disciples did. We can be confident, courageous, and of good cheer because of him. It says in Proverbs 3, 25, 26, Have no fear of sudden disaster or of ruin that overtakes the wicked, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being snared. So again, he's telling you to have confidence no matter what comes your way. He's going to be there. He's going to ensure that you don't get tripped up by somebody, that a false prophet where someone's not going to sweep you out and take you away. He's giving you that word here, that confidence. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being snared. His words constantly tell you that he's going to take care of you and to be bold, that he'll be your shield, he'll be your rock. He's telling you this ahead of time. He's preparing us to be victorious in Christ because that's what he's called us to be. We have to believe that we have the courage to battle. We have the courage, we have the valor to fight 
spiritual warfare because that's what we are here called to do, spiritual warfare. And sometimes that's 10, 10 or 15 hours on your knees. That may require some fasting. You might lose some weight in that too, but nevertheless, it may require you to do that. Are you going to be obedient for that? That's the question. Here is the promise for God superintending care for us, a care that his, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> He is, uh, he is the promise, here is the promise of God's superintendent care for us. A care that is absent from the lives of those who reject him. But for those who place their faith in Christ for salvation, we are to have no fear. Because Luke 12, 32 tells us, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He says that you're the head and not the tail. We're ambassadors of Christ. He's given us all dominion over all things, the word says. In this great promise lies the basis of our confidence in Christ, the courage that he gives us, and he also tells us to be of good cheer. That's who Christ is in us, and that's who we should be. I'm going to close out with the last two scriptures, the first two scriptures I gave you in, in the beginning. Because I think they're very powerful. They really sum up what I'm trying to say here today. Joshua 1.9. It says, I, <clears throat> have I not commanded you? Be strong. Be bold. Have that courage. He's telling us. He's telling us, don't be afraid. Because things are going to happen. When they happen, because you're strong and you're being courageous and you're not afraid, you're not going to get discouraged. And that's what it's telling here. He says, for... The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So no matter where you go, what battle you're facing, what giant's in front of you, he's going to be that shield to protect you and cover you. That's what it says here in Joshua 1, 9. You got to stand on that boldness and courage. Break fear. Fear is of the enemy. It's not of God. It's not one of God's tools. Now, my favorite word over here, Deuteronomy. 31.6, again, be, bold, be strong, be courageous, do not be afraid. Don't be terrified of what's going to be out there when you're ministering. They're not going to like you. They may even spit on you, call you names, freak, whatever it may be. But you got to be strong and you got to be bold and you got to have the confidence in the God that you serve. Don't worry about what the world thinks. You're trying to help them from the fear that they have. The world is running around. They were talking about uh, uh, statistics that the numbers are just ridiculously up in the churches online. People are, are, are getting saved. Uh, I think I was listening to Greg Glory in two days. He, in two of the messages that he gave, it went from like 1,700 to like 30,000 30, 30, people in the Sunday messages that are getting saved over the service. You know, and not just his church. Imagine all the other churches. But the, the opportunity we have right now to speak about salvation, to speak about what God is in our lives and who God is and can be in their lives, it's an open ticket right now for us. It's an open ticket to give an opportunity for someone that don't know God, someone that don't have courage, someone that doesn't know how to develop courage, an opportunity for us to teach them what God has taught us. So with that, that ends my message. I just want to thank you for this opportunity once again. And again, I want to say everybody that's out there on Periscope, also out there on Facebook, uh, my, I hear the stimulus checks are coming in, so don't forget to tie on them. God still needs your money. It ain't free money, huh? It ain't free money. Um, so I just want to go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord. We thank you that we're here to be used as a vessel for your word, Father God. And we just ask, Lord, that your blessings will extend upon your people, Father God, that are out there, Father Lord. Set up opportunities, Lord, right now, Father God. Distance opportunities, Father God, for us to minister, like I said earlier, through the phones, Lord, through, through emails, Father God. Any way that we can reach them that are lost with your word, Lord, open our minds. Let, her, let us see the vision with your eyes and not our own eyes, Father God. Lord, we just thank you. Everybody that's out there, have a blessed evening in the name of Jesus. Amen.